Okay, welcome back. Today we will be talking about a iterative method called the multigrid method. And it is a method that is very important for high performance computing because it is it has the capability of solving very, very large problems in an efficient way. So some of the classical iterative methods that you may have learned about, uh, such as uh, uh, Gauss-Seidel and even the conjugate gradient method, these methods suffer from the problem that when you increase the problem size, the number of iterations also increases. Typically the work per iteration is constant for a problem, for a given problem size. That means when you increase the problem size, the amount of work you have to perform increases faster than the problem size because the number of iterations increases. Okay, so if that continues on, then you're very limited in terms of the size of the problems that you can solve. Now, the multigrid method is a method that does not have that problem when designed properly. Um, it is applied to problems from partial differential equations, so discretizations from partial differential equations, and it is one of the most exciting areas of uh, numerical linear algebra research. So that will be the topic for today. So I will uh, start on the board and then um, show you some demos of multigrid um, as we go along. Okay, so this is a method for solving sparse linear equations, ax equals to b, from generally from discretizations of partial differential equations. And they can be applied to some other types of matrices as well, but it's much harder to design multigrid methods for those. And I should say that there are multigrid methods for nonlinear problems as well. Okay, and multigrid methods for other types of numerical problems. So we're going to focus on uh, solving these sparse linear systems. And as I just said, it's a scalable iterative method. Meaning that the number of iterations remains constant. Requiring constant number of iterations for any problem size. Okay, so these are the two main points to uh, know about multigrid besides how it works. So let me compare this to um, just a basic iterative method. Okay, so a basic iterative method like Jacobi or Gauss-Seidel, which I'm going to call a relaxation iterative method. So recall a relaxation type iterative method. Okay. So here, each equation, so let me write down each equation in AX, AX equals to B. So for equation I, okay, so we have the AI1, X1 plus AI2, X2 plus all the way up to AIN, if we have N equations and N unknowns, XN equals BI. Okay, so that's the ith equation. And in these relaxation iterative methods, we're going to relax each one of these equations. Okay. And what I mean by relax is um, if we're going to relax equation i, that means we're going to solve for xi, keeping all of the other x's constant. Okay. So that means we're going to compute xi, and that's equal to. 1 over AII 
bi minus ai1 x1 minus ai2 x2 minus all the way up to ai n x n except for the ith term. So in this in this uh, sequence, except for a i i x i. Okay, so this is this is called relaxation, and I'm sure you're familiar with two relaxation methods, as, as I just mentioned. If we relax all of the equations simultaneously, this is called the Jacobi method. It's called the Jacobi method. And if we relax all the equations sequentially, that's called the Gauss-Seidel method. And the Jacobi and Gauss-Seidel methods also have matrix iterations, which you may be familiar with, rather than this interpretation in terms of relaxations. And from this, you might guess that uh, the Jacobi method is much more parallel, because it's doing all of these relaxations at the same time. But in terms of number of iterations, it, the Jacobi iteration might take more iterations, because in Gauss compared to Gauss-Seidel, where you're using more updated information at every, whenever you perform a relaxation, okay? So if I can try to characterize the convergence of these methods, okay? The convergence is typically fast initially, but then it slows down. So if we graphed, let's say the error norm or residual norm, let's say on a log scale, okay, and then this is the number of iterations, okay, the convergence typically looks like this. It's pretty nice, but then it slows down. So even on a log scale, it will seem like it's slowing down. So convergence is typically fast initially, And then it slows down. Okay, so one interesting question is why does it slow down? Okay, maybe we should write that. So it's a good question to think about. Why does it slow down? And it's related to this other fact that I'm going to show you in a moment, which is that in these methods, the, these methods tend to smooth the error. So what does that mean? It means that if you looked at a plot of the error, okay, that the, as the iterations progress, the error looks smoother and smoother. I'll show you uh, a demonstration of that in MATLAB in a moment, but let's first write that down. So relaxation methods. tend to smooth the error. And typically that'll be the case when we have uh, discretizations from PDEs, at least in the, for instance in the diffusion case. Okay? All right, so let me show you some things in MATLAB. Okay. 
so here first I have a, a program, very simple program. I'm going to solve this equation ax equals to b. A is discretization of a finite difference discretization of a diffusion problem. The right hand side I'm just going to set to zero. Okay. And I'm going to start with an initial guess, x, that is random. Okay. So x is also the error. x is both the solution and the error because the right hand side is zero. Okay, and it's a, is it a, it's a 2D problem. Okay, so forget about this, this that comment is incorrect. And we could try different problem sizes. And I'm going to run the Gauss-Seidel method where the um, matrix M in the splitting is the lower triangular part of A. And then I'm going to plot the residual history. Okay, so I'm going to change that since those comments don't apply. So let's change, let's set N1 is equal to um, 10. Okay, so we have a 10 by 10 grid. And if we run this script, um, we see that the length of this history vector is 27, so we require 27 iterations to converge. And if we plot on a log scale the history vector, looks like this. So you can see that we're plotting a norm, norm of the error. Actually, I haven't shown you this code, but this is the norm of the error. It seems to be going down, and then it's slowing down. Okay. And we require 27 iterations to converge. Well, we could look at the iter basic function. OK, so it's uh, stopping when the norm is less than a tolerance. And the tolerance that I set in the previous slide, I mean in the previous picture, was what? Was uh, just, o just two orders of magnitude. Okay, so two orders of magnitude. And we can, so that was 27 iterations, and we can try to do a larger problem. So n equals 20. Okay, so now a 20 by 20 grid. And if we run this, see we have 29 iterations. The number of iterations is, is increasing. Um, since we have a random right hand side, it's hard to predict exactly the number of iterations that we might see. So let's try, let's say, um, 100. So this is quite a larger, quite a larger problem. So n1 should be set to 100. OK, and we have 292 iterations. So the number of iterations went up quite a bit. OK, so since the work per iteration, as I said, stays the same, Right, the total amount of work will increase when we increase the problem size. OK, so, so this gives us some motivation to study methods that are more optimal than that, okay, that are optimal. OK, so let's look at the second demonstration. And in this second demonstration, I'm, it's a one-dimensional problem. And this is the initial error. And I'm going to apply Gauss-Seidel one step at a time, and we're going to look at what the initial error looks like. Okay, So that's the initial error. After one step of Gauss-Seidel, see the error has decreased in magnitude. Okay, That's good. And as we take additional iterations, the error is decreasing. But you can see that the error is not decreasing as much. Okay, And then furthermore, the error looks smoother than before. So remember the very first picture, the error looked very oscillatory, and now the error looks smoother. But convergence is much slower. OK, so that, so why does the error look smoother? Um, I'll try to explain that in a moment. And this also happens in 2D as well. OK, so 
here's an example in 2D. So here's the 2D problem. We have an initial error. It's very, it's random. The initial error is random. And I'm going to apply Gauss-Seidel in one iteration, two, three, uh-oh. I think I, let me check my code for a second. Okay, so this was a slightly different matrix. Let me go back and set it to this matrix, which is the diffusion problem. Okay, so here we go again. So as we take more iterations, you can see that the error is becoming smoother. Okay. I'm not plotting the uh, magnitude of the error, but you can see, be because they will all basically, uh, the error is also decreasing, but you can see that the error is smoother. So it's not as if the, the error, which looked random initially, all, you, all went down in size. That happened, but as well as that, the error actually uh, became smoother. Okay. So the idea of multigrid is that we're going to use a relaxation method like Gauss-Seidel in the regime where it's converging fast, like just one or two steps, okay? And then the air becomes smooth, and what we're going to do is we're going to project the air onto a coarser grid where the air no longer looks smooth, and then solve on that coarser grid, okay? And then we can repeat that recursively. Whenever the air looks smooth on our grid, we're going to project it onto a coarser grid and solve and then apply the relaxation method on the coarser grid. Okay, so that's the idea of multigrid. Um, what is, do I have a third demo? Okay, so in this third demonstration, I'm going to, it's again a one-dimensional problem, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to start, I'm going to try to solve AX equals to zero again, but for the initial guess, instead of using a, a error that has high frequency components only, I'm going, to, I'm going to control the frequency of the error, okay? So I can set the, so this is a one-dimensional problem I'm gonna generate. I'm going to set the initial error or the initial guess to be the sine function, right? And k is going to con control how oscillatory the sine function is, okay? So large values of k will mean oscillatory, and smaller values of k is less oscillatory. And we can plot the history um, depending on how oscillatory the initial error is. Okay, so this function takes, okay, we're going to, let's start with uh, k equals, k equals uh, 20. Okay, so for k equals 20, the uh, initial error is quite oscillatory, right? So this is the convergence history. And now let's try k equals 6, I guess, from the example that we had over here. So in comparison, this is for k equals 6. You can see that the convergence is much slower when the error is already smooth. Okay, and we can maybe even try k equals 2. Okay, so this is for k equals 2. Now the convergence is really slow. So how fast these relaxation methods 
will converge kind of depends on you know, how smooth your error already is. Okay? So we really want to apply these methods when the error is quite uh, oscillatory, not when the error is smooth. Okay, so now let's go back to the board. And we'll write down some of those observations. So first, why does why does why does uh, why does relaxation tend to smooth the error? Let's try to look, think about that a little bit. Um, and let's take as, as an example um, the five-point five Laplacian. So suppose A is from a five-point Laplacian. Basically, this is the matrix we've been looking at over and over again. Then, this relaxation step over here, I'll call it asterisk, then asterisk is an averaging or smoothing type of operation. Okay, so if I write down, if I write down this, okay, for ax equals to zero, then let's say we have, for example, we have an equation x3 is equal to one over four, right? We have four as on the diagonals, and let's say b is zero if we choose the right hand side to be zero. So x's here are also going to be the errors. Um, and the off-diagonal entries are all minus 1, right? So these are all x1 plus x2. Let's say x1 and x2 are neighbors of x3 in the grid, as are x4 and x5. So it has four neighbors. So what is this? This is just averaging your neighbors to get the new value, right? And these are also the errors, because we're looking at ax equals to 0, OK? So when, the, when your neighbors are very different from you, okay, in other words, the error is not smooth, then your value could really change. Right? But if your neighbors have approximately the same value as you, meaning the error is smooth, then you're not going to change very much. And this is also why the convergence tends to slow down when the error is smooth. Yeah, so as in, in this example, I'm kind of assuming that the initial error is smooth. Sorry, the initial error is oscillatory. So we're getting rid of the oscillatory components of the error. And then it's harder to get rid of the smoother components of the error. Right? And then the idea of multigrid is to try to fix this problem over here. Okay. So let's write down the idea of multigrid. When the error is smooth, transfer to a coarser grid where the error looks oscillatory and smooth the error on that grid.
Okay? And then the second idea is to apply this first idea recursively. So we're going to apply recursively until the grid, the coarser grids is small enough, and then we'll just solve exactly on the small grid. Apply recursively until the grid is small enough. to solve for the error exactly on that grid. Okay. So we have a number of components of the multigrid algorithm. I'm going to write mg for multigrid for short. The first thing that we need is a smoother, something that smooths errors. And we have used uh, Gauss-Seidel in the example, but you can also use things like uh, Jacobi, many other things as well. So we need a smoother. We need a way of transferring quantities, vectors, errors, residuals from the fine grid to the coarse grid. The fine grid meaning the or grid that we've already, that we've started on, let's say. Okay, so, and that is called a restriction operator. For transferring things from the fine grid to coarse grid, from fine grid to coarse grid, Okay. In order to correct the error on the finer grid, we need to also be able to transfer quantities from the coarse grid to the fine grid. Okay, so just the opposite of this, and that's called a prolongation or interpolation operator. So we need a prolongation or interpolation operator to transfer quantities from the coarse grid to the fine grid. And we also need an operator on the coarse grid that we solve with. And that's just called the coarse grid operator. Or maybe if we are doing this recursively, I should maybe say coarse grid operators, because there are many of these coarse grids. There's like a, the original fine grid and then many sequences of coarse grids. Okay, so let's look at these components one at a time. We've already talked, uh, talked about the smoother, so we won't talk about that. So let's first talk about restriction. And this is from fine to coarse. So I'm going to just draw a very small grid. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven grid points. Okay, so here's a, here, this is going to be my fine grid, okay? And I might have some function on the fine grid that is already smooth, okay? So I have some values along this fine grid. It could be the error, and the error looks kind of smooth, okay? And I want to transfer this error onto a coarser grid. Okay, and the coarse grid I'm going to choose is going to be like this. Right, I'm just taking every other grid point. This is a 1D problem. I'm going to 
show these examples in 1D, right? And this value should be transferred to the course grid. This value should be transferred to the course grid. This value should be transferred to the course grid. And this value should be transferred to the course grid. And the easiest restriction operator, OK, so this looks a little bit like that on the right, except that it is um, less smooth. OK, and the easiest restriction operator to do is to use is called injection. In other words, we're going to just take whatever values are over here, and we're just going to inject it onto the course grid. So that's the easiest operator, easiest type of restriction operator. So this is called injection. Right, I'm going to, we can write it in matrix form. Okay, the input is a vector that is a seven by one vector in this case. And we're going to multiply by this matrix and the result is going to be a three by one vector. Or is it four by one? Um, I actually drew my course grid wrong. It's not exactly what I wanted to do. So I'm going to do three by one, and there's a reason why um, I, need to, I need to do it another way. So three by one, I'm not going to choose these. So th the reason is because I imagine that I have another grid point over here that is the boundary. And I'm going to have, I'm going to assume that the residual or the error is zero on the boundary because that's a known, let's say we have Dirichlet boundary conditions, okay? So in order to keep the mesh, um, in order for me to be able to refine the mesh in a way so that the spacing from the boundary is the same as the spacing everywhere else, I'm going to use a slightly different choice. I guess I should erase that. So I'm going to choose these three points as the course grid. Okay, and I can inject these. So this one is higher. Getting this right is really important in order to get your code to work properly. I've struggled so so long with trying to make sure that the that the interpolation is correct at the different levels. In other words, your operator looks like the same thing. Okay, so what does this matrix look look like? Um, so we have some values, seven values, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? And we have three values on the output, and this value is just going to get mapped directly, injected directly. So that is zero. So that is one over here, and all the others are zeros, right? And then the fifth value is going to get injected, and then the uh, that's not the fourth, the fourth and the sixth. Okay. So this is what the matrix looks like. Everything else is zero. So this is just called the injection operator. You can actually inject another way as well, and it tends to be more accurate. And the other way of injecting is called full weighting. Because what we've done over here is we've entirely ignored these, other, these values at these other points. Okay, so to take into account these, the values at these other points, we can use um, a different injection operator, which is called full weighting. And let me write that over here, I guess.
So again, we're going to have a 3 by 7 matrix. The input is a 7 by 1 matrix. The output is a 3 by 1 matrix. Okay. And the first value here is now going to be an averaging of these three points. Okay, so the first row, let's say, is one quarter, one half, and one quarter. So I'm going to take one half of this value plus one quarter of the neighboring values, and that will be the new value on the course grid. Right? And similarly for the other two course grid points, one quarter, one half, one quarter. I'm running out of space in my matrix. One quarter, one half, and one quarter. Okay. So this is called full weighting. All right, so those are two very common restriction operators. Now we'll talk about uh, interpolation or projection operator or prolongation operator. And the picture here is the same. So remember, this is from coarse to fine. The picture here is the same, but reversed. So we have some values over here, and we want to put them onto a fine grid. We have some values on a coarse grid, and we want to put them on a fine grid. Okay, so the input is going to be a 3 by 1 vector. And the output is going to be a 7 by 1 vector. So we have a matrix that is 7 by 3. OK. And let's look at the middle point. I guess that's the easiest thing. Um, so what, what should we do here? We could just put this value directly on there, right? So for the middle value, let's say we'll just use exactly the value that we have on the coarse grid points. And for values that are in between two coarse grid points, let's say that one, then we'll just use the, the average of the two neighboring coarse grid points, right? So. In that case, we're going to have a 1 half and a 1 half. And here's another one. And then for this one over here, okay, we only have one coarse grid point over here. We're going to use that one, plus we're going to use the boundary. But the boundary is 0. So whatever coefficient we have for that doesn't matter. So we can use 1 half over here. Okay. So the row sums are going to be 1, except that the boundary, they're going to be 1 half. But we assume that there's a 1 half times the boundary value as well. But since it multiplies by 0, we can ignore it. So this assumes 0 values on the boundary. Okay? And then the other points are 1 half, 1 half, 0, 1, and then 1 half. So this is a 7 by 3 matrix. Okay, so this is called, um, I don't know if it has a name. This is the most common, this is just linear interpolation, right? And in 2D, we just use bilinear interpolation. OK, so the last component we need to talk about in multigrid is the coarse grid operator. So when we've transferred all of these 
quantities onto the coarse grid, we need to solve with a matrix that corresponds to that coarse grid. And there's two options for that. So one option is to just rediscretize on a coarse grid. So let's say A, I'm going to say A capital H, superscript capital H. That's going to be just a rediscretization. with a coarser mesh, with a coarser mesh spacing. So this is what I mean by the superscript H. I'm going to use a mesh spacing of capital H. Sometimes I'll use a superscript lowercase h to mean a, a mesh spacing with a lowercase h spacing. Okay. The other option is to use the restriction and prolongation operators. Okay, so we have our original matrix A, and we'll just apply the restriction and prolongation matrices to those, to that. So here AH is going to be equal to, we have our original matrix. We're going to apply the prolongation operator on the right side, okay, and we're going to apply the restriction operator on the left side. So this is now a smaller matrix. Okay? And this is sometimes called the Galerkin coarse grid operator. Okay? So these are two options. This operator tends to have more non-zeros than this one. Okay? Um, but sometimes you don't know how to rediscretize. If you if your method if you want to keep a method as that is completely algebraic, then you would use something like this. Okay. In other words, someone gives you just the matrix, you don't know how to rediscretize. You don't know what what the PDE was. Okay. So now we're going to uh, we're almost ready to write down the multigrid algorithm. But before we get there. I'm going to use a number of things over and over again, um, some, some definitions and useful relationships. Um, so in order to make sure that you all know these things, that, let's write those down. <coughs> so definitions and useful relations. Yep, sure. Right. So I can keep a smoothing. Mm -hmm. Then you do that, keep doing it until you sort of solve that exactly in the close one. And but what is the meaning of a close to fine? Because if you make that your fine grid, that's a still yeah, so, smooth. So so what's gonna happen is we're we projected the problem onto the coarser grid and we're going to uh, smooth the air on the coarser grid. Right. right? Right. So somehow we have to transfer that correction that we found on the coarser grid back to the fine grid. Right. So we need to have a way of taking coarse grid quantities, in particular the error correction that we found on the coarse grid, and we need to transfer it to the fine grid so that the solution on the fine grid can be updated. Uh, you still have, for example, this a three by one, and yep. then by you mapping that. So are you saying? So we need to go right. back and forth. Right. So that's three by one is the solution or the error? So this is going to be the error, the error correction on the coarser grid. I see. So that's an error, not the. Error. Yeah. Okay. So we. So uh, we never actually transferred the approximate solution from coarse to fine. And the reason for that is there's no reason to think that the, approximate, that the solution is smooth. If the solution were yeah. smooth, then we could always use a, fine, a coarser grid yeah. for, for the problem. 
So we, we can't make the assumption that the solution is smooth. So the only quantity that is smooth is the error. In the example that I showed, because I used a x equals to 0, the solution happens also to be smooth. And the solution is equal to the error in that simple case. So that m maybe I won't use that example in the future. It maybe causes a little bit of confusion. Are you saying we can assume the error are smooth? Yes. Um, not for all problems, mm -hmm. right? Um, in general, there will be some components of the error that are slow to converge. And it might not look geometrically smooth, and sometimes we just call that algebraically smooth error. And we want to make sure that that algebraically smooth error can be represented well on the coarser grid. But in the examples that, I'm sh that, I've, sh that I've shown, like the, the error does look smooth after I've applied the smoother. Yes, question, another but question? I've got one question is, in order for you to know the error, you must know the ground truth. Maybe the yes. Answer. Second question is the weighting. Like for example, this one, the value you have divided into half. Can you choose another different weighting? Yes, so this is not the only types of interpolation and prolongation if you, operation. If you choose one, the, the prolongation, the, the reversing, the close to five will be the matching. Yes, if you do do that, so that's a very nice observation. So you notice that the... Uh, one third, for example. Yes, well, notice that th this matrix, this is the restriction matrix, so we could call this R. I guess I didn't define R. So R is a restriction, some restriction matrix. It could be this or it could be the injection operator. And this matrix we can call P. Um, this matrix we can call P, the prolongation matrix. And you notice that they are actually transposes of each other except for a constant. Right? And that's kind of nice because if the matrix A is symmetric, then RAP is also going to be symmetric. So that is... Uh, one reason to try to keep these things um, as transposes of each other if possible. But on the other hand, um, these, no, this is just, this is linear interpolation, so it's a nice operator to use, but you can imagine for different types of stencils, depending on your matrix A, you could use different types of prolongation and different types of, of restriction. These are just two examples. In, in other words, um, lots of opportunities for uh, developing specialized methods just based on this idea. Any other questions? So, so not necessarily my waiting part could be linear. Sorry? Not necessarily my waiting uh, part could be linear. It can be non-linear. Uh, Yes, but I don't know if nonlinear is actually going to be that useful. Um, it's difficult. Yeah. I don't know of anyone using a nonlinear type of interpolation there. Um, let me think about that. Actually, truth, right? Um, no, yes, we don't know. We can't check. We can't check. We can't check that the error is smooth. But conceptually, there is some components of the error that are slow to converge. So we just have to, we just make the assumption that, that there are some components that are... We, can estimate. We, don't need to, we don't need to know what the error is. We don't need to know what the exact error is. We're going to come up with error corrections. There was another question. These questions are good. I think the ideas behind multigrid are quite subtle. Um, I've learned about multigrid 20 years ago, and I'm still refining my understanding of multigrid. Okay. All right, so some definitions and useful relations. So one is called the error equation. And that's a relationship between the error and the residual. So if E is the error, then the residual is A times E. Okay, it's straightforward to, to derive.
The second one, um, I don't know if it has a name, but suppose that I have some value of x solution, and I correct the error. So I, and I make a correction to it to get x prime. And the correction is called e. Okay? Then the residual can also be corrected. So the residual after the correction is the residual for this value of x minus a times the correction. Okay? And then the third thing to, and this is also easy to derive. And then the third thing that might be a little bit confusing, so I want to put it out up front, is that if we apply a smoother, to ax equals to b. So ax equals to b is what we're trying to solve. Let's say we apply Jacobi or Gauss-Seidel to, to this using an initial guess. Let's call it x0. OK. So that is the same as applying as applying a smoother to a e equals r, so the error equation, okay, where r is the residual with this initial guess, and then updating x with the solution that we find from the smoothing. Okay, so these, this is equivalent. And this is also easy to verify. So this E here is the result of the smoothing. And since I'm running out of space to write it, I'm just, I'll just repeat that this R is the residual given this approximation x0. Okay, so now we're ready to write down the multigrid algorithm. So given the matrix A, given the right-hand side vector B, and given some initial approximation, I'm going to call it x0, find the new approximation, and I'm just going to call it x. And this is the algorithm for one iteration, sometimes called one cycle. Okay. And if you want to perform multiple cycles, you just repeat this algorithm. OK, so what is the first step? First step should be straightforward. We just apply the smoother to the original problem, right? We have, we have a brand new problem. We're just going to apply the smoother to it. So apply smoother to ax equals to 0. Sorry, ax equals to b. with x0 as initial guess. And this is sometimes called the pre-smoothing step. Okay. 
And what should be the second step? So now we think that the error is smooth, and we want to transfer the error onto the coarse grid. Sorry? Apply the prolongation. Yeah, so we're going to apply the restriction, actually. Yeah, yeah. We're going to apply the restriction to what? Uh, okay, so what we have is the solution on the, on, the, on the fine grid, but we don't want to put that onto the coarse grid because that is not necessarily smooth. Right, so we want to put the error onto, we want to find the error on the coarse grid, so we don't know the error. But we can apply the error supervisor. Yeah, so the only, exactly, so we have the error equation. The only thing that we can transfer is the residual. Okay, so let's first compute the residual and then transfer that to the coarse grid using the restriction operator. Sound good? Okay, so compute the residual R and transfer to coarse grid. So R on the coarse grid, by transferring to the coarse grid, it means we're going to apply the restriction operator to the residual. Okay. So the discussion that we had just, just right now I think is very good. The, um, we can't transfer x, right, because x is not smooth. We can't transfer the error because we don't know what the error is at this coarse grid. Right? But we can try to transfer the residual, okay, and then find the error on the solve the error equation on the coarser grid. So the third step is to solve the coarse grid problem A E H equals R H A H. So here's the coarse grid matrix. Here's the residual that we've transferred onto the coarse grid. And we're going to try to find the error on the coarse grid. And it is smooth. We think it is smooth, so it can we should be able to represent it well on the coarse grid. And if and in multigrid we do this recursively. Right? So instead of solving this, how so how do we solve this? We call multigrid again. Right? So in other words, we apply the smoother, we compute the residual, then we solve onto, onto another coarser grid. So do this recursively. Step four. Now we have the error on the coarse grid. What should we do? Now we want to interpolate it onto the fine grid and then correct the error on the fine grid. So transfer error to fine grid and correct. Okay, so our new x is going to be equal to x0. Actually, I shouldn't call it x0 because this x over here on the right-hand side is the result of the smoothing. Okay. Plus the interpolation of the coarse grid error onto the fine grid. Okay. So x equals x plus a correction. This is the correction on the coarse grid. This makes it a correction on the fine grid. And then there's one final step, which is sometimes optional. It's the post-smoothing step. 
and that is we're going to apply the smoother to AX equals to B using X as the initial approximation. And there's a couple reasons for wanting to do this post-smoothing step. One is that it makes this operator, this one cycle operator, symmetric, which you might want if you're using it as actually as a preconditioner. And the other is that after you have transferred the fine grid after you've done this coarse grid correction, you may have introduced some high frequency components. You may have, I'm not exactly sure. You may have, I guess. And um, you, you can just take advantage of trying to smooth that out immediately. Okay? In the multi grid literature, sometimes you'll see diagrams. Like that look like the following. So this is this is um, your problem on the fine grid. Okay, and you can project this down to a problem on a coarse grid, and you solve on the coarse grid and then you take the error correction on the coarse grid and you project it back onto the fine grid. Okay, so this is a diagram of this algorithm. Sometimes it's called, this is one cycle, and because of the shape of this picture, sometimes it's called a V-cycle. Okay, so this is called the V-cycle. And this is just the two-level V-cycle. And in general, you have a fine grid you go down to a coarser grid, you go down to yet a coarser grid, right? And then you go back up. So then this would be called a three level V cycle, right? And you may not have converged after one V cycle, so then you can take additional V cycles. Okay? Besides V cycles, there are things, there are other cycles. One is called a W cycle. So you start at a fine grid point, go down, go down, go up. But instead of going back up, you go down again, and you make this thing that looks like a W. So this cycling spends more time on the coarse grids. It may be cheaper to spend time on the coarser grids because they're smaller. Okay. And, and another reason for using a double W cycle is that suppose you have some kind of proof that, that um, a two-level V cycle will converge, but you don't know whether or not a three-level V cycle will converge. Okay? So a W cycle is actually composed of only two-level V cycles. So here is... Here you don't. Here you've, you know that if you go from here to there, you will converge, but if you go down and up and up, you might not converge. But here you're actually doing more V cycles before you go back up. So there is some some theory that we're not going into that um, that says you can use a W cycle if you know something about two-level convergence, but not multi-level convergence. Okay. So here's a question. As I said at the beginning, uh, we want multigrid to be a method in which the amount of work is constant per iteration, and the number of iterations will be constant. But for a larger and larger problem, we may need more and more levels. Does that mean that the work is not constant? In other words, does the amount of work
per cycle increase faster than order n, where n is the number of, let's say, degrees of freedom in your problem. Because we have to take more, more levels. So when we have larger n, we need more levels. Does that mean that the amount of work increases? So the simple answer is no, as long as you design these grids properly. So the work at each level so let's say we do n amount of work at the first level. Right? We have n degrees of freedom. And at the next level, let's say the grid is, in the one dimensional example, the grid is only half as large. So the amount of work that we have to do at the next level is one half n. And then at the next coarser level, one quarter n. And you can add that up. No matter how many levels you take, the amount of work is still going to grow proportionally with the problem size. Okay, so this is a rough explanation of why the work per iteration stays the same. So let me give you a little hint of what the convergence analysis of these methods look like. And we'll start with, so, so what, are, what would we like to be able to say, uh, say in order to um, show that the method converges. We want to show that the norm of the error after we do one cycle is smaller. So we have some error at the beginning, has a certain norm. After we do this, we want to say, we want to say that the norm after this is smaller. So that would be the very first thing that we would like to show. And then there are some additional things that we won't go into that says we want to have certain quantities uh, be bounded independent of the problem size. And if those quantities which show up um, in what I'm about to show you, then, um, and those are bounded independent of problem size, then we have convergence that is independent of problem size. Okay, so let me talk about this thing that is often called coarse grid correction. So given initial approximation x0 and initial residual r0, okay. so we've computed r0 over here. So this is just the coarse grid correction part, just steps 2, 3, 4. We'll talk a bit about the smoothing in a moment. So given these initial approximations, We have the initial residual. We've transfer it to the coarse grid. So this is the residual on the coarse grid now. Then we are going to solve with the coarse grid problem. So let me write that as RAP inverse. Okay, so now this is the error on the coarse grid. We're going to transfer the error to the fine grid. It's multiplying by p. And we're going to update x0. So the new x is equal to x0 plus this correction. OK? We could call that x1, maybe. So 
So you can think of this thing as an approximation to A inverse, right? And then A inverse times this residual is some correction. And I wanted to point out that this form shows up very, very frequently. It even shows up in Krylov subspace methods where these P's and these R's are bases for the Krylov subspace. Okay, so it's trying to find a solution that is best in some sense in all of the possible with all of the possible corrections that lie in the space spanned by this matrix P. Right? The solution, this approximate solution is going to lie in this space spanned by P. Right? And we want to find the best solution in that case. Okay? Um, so let me write down what the coarse grid correction operator is. So this is what we think of as coarse grid correction. But we want to know what happens to the error, right? So rather than what happens to the residual. And we're going to use AE0 equals R0. OK, so we can, if we have the initial residual, we can know what the initial error is. And if we have the residual after we've done the correction, we can find the error after the correction. So we want to know the relationship between E0 and E1. Okay. And let's recall so E is some correction. If we make a correction to X, then the residual can be updated this way. I think that's just exactly these two things I just, just wrote. So in terms of what we've written down over here, R1 is equal to R0 minus AE. And this is equal to R0 minus A times, what is our E? E is this thing, right? That's our correction. So let's write that down. P R A P inverse R R zero. Right, I've just substituted that. And to get E, so on the left hand side, R one is equal to A E one. And on the right-hand side, R0 is equal to A R0, A P R A P inverse R0, sorry, R R0. And actually, I should substitute, I can substitute R0 with, um, This should be an E, right? And I'll put A E0 over here as well. Okay. So these A's go away. So E1 is equal to identity minus P R A P inverse R A E zero. Okay? So this matrix here is called the coarse grid correction operator. It takes your E zero and it maps it to E one. So I'm going to call this K.
Okay. So there are some interesting properties of K. One is that K is a projector. So meaning if you look at K squared, that's equal to K. Apply K to a vector twice, you just get the same as applying it once. So you apply K to a vector, a projector. Right, you apply it again, you, then you don't change what you, what you projected the first time, what you got the first time. And you can just either multiply this out or recognize that this has the form of a projector. Sorry? If what is linear? Yeah, so these are all matrices, so should be linear. And you could also notice that if the error is in the range of P, in other words, if you could write the error as P times some vector, right, then the result is exactly zero. So the coarse grid correction exactly eliminates errors that are in the range of P. And you can see that just by seeing that RAP um, cancels with this RAP inverse, okay? And then you have P minus P, and that's equal to zero. Okay? So if you put all this together, with the smoother, So the smoother, let me just write it over here, um, E1 is equal to I minus M inverse A E0. So this is the iteration matrix associated with relaxation methods where M is the lower triangular part of A in the case of Gauss-Seidel, right? So we have E1, this is a different E1, this is the E1 after the whole V cycle, right? Um, and let me call this S. I knew I wanted to do that. So we take E0. We're going to apply the smoother to get a new error after smoothing. We're going to apply the coarse grid operator to get a new error after applying coarse grid. And then after applying the coarse grid correction and then applying the smoother again. The, this is the post smoother. Okay. And what we would like if we take norms of both sides, that the norm of E1 is less than, and let me just use consistency here, so we have this inequality due to, consisten in, due to consistency, we would like all of these things to be less than 1. Okay, and we, if we have a good smoother, then the norm of that is going to be less than 1. And because K is a projection operator, then we know that its norm is going to be, is going to be 1. And we can actually, we actually would like to say something about all of these things in the A norm. You can show that the matrix K, or the coarse grid correction operator, is symmetric in the, is symmetric in the A norm. Uh, symmetric with respect to A, I should say. Uh, and you can say something about the norm of, of K and the A norm. Okay, so sorry about going a little bit, uh, uh, a little bit over time. Um, no exercise today, because I know you have an assignment due tomorrow. And uh, our request is for you to um, just slide your assignment underneath Professor Wong's door. Um, hopefully by 2 p.m. tomorrow afternoon. And if you have email, if, if, if you can send it by email, then you can just send it to him directly, and you don't have to, you don't have to hand in something like that. Yes, question? Is it sensitive to initial error, initial gaze, ex data? Does this organism is sensitive to that initial gaze, ex 
zero. Um, it is sensitive to the initial guess x zero in the sense that if the initial error is smooth, then some of these smoothing steps is not going to do very much. Right? So you may be, you know, you may be, uh, that, that, yeah, you might, these might not be necessary until you get immediately to a coarser grid. So from that point of view, it is. But otherwise, generally, no. So generally, people do not try to adjust this algorithm for different initial approximations x0. But in practice, there could be some differences in performance because of the smoothness of the error depending on x0. OK, any other questions? If not, um, we have a workshop tomorrow. And I guess you guys are welcome to attend. And if I don't see you there, I will give a, a talk on some of my recent research, and others will as well. And if I don't see you there, then I'll see you on Monday. Have a nice weekend. Oh. Okay, weekly yes, OK, weekly assi good, good question. So there, will, there is a weekly assignment. And I will post the weekly assignment uh, tomorrow, um, hopefully by 2 o'clock. And that will be also be due the following Friday. So the weekly assignments will be posted on Friday, and they'll do the following Friday. Thanks for the reminder. <laughs>